Imagine the scene outside King's Cross Station in London, which I'm showing in this picture over here. And let's say that we want to look at the number of people in this plaza. So you can see there's some people sitting over here. There's this person walking over here. There's some other people over here. It's not particularly busy, uh, even though uh, it's perhaps the middle of the day on a nice sunny afternoon or morning. But it says 1.20, so it's the afternoon. And uh, it's not too many people there. But you could imagine that perhaps at uh, 9 in the morning or half to 9, there'd be a lot more people on the plaza. It would be rather busy. And in contrast, if you were to take at 1.20 a.m. in the early morning, there'd be nobody there. So if the... Uh, question I wanted to ask you is how many people do you expect to see on the plaza? At first, it seems pretty uh, random. It doesn't, it doesn't, there seems to be no rhyme or reason. But in fact, when you think some more about it, uh, you would expect a pattern something like this. You know, if this were time on this axis, and this is the number of people on this axis, you would be able to say that, well, around 9 a.m., you're probably going to see some kind of a peak. And then perhaps around the, the commute time at about 5 p.m. or so, there'd be another little peak. And in between, it's probably it's going to be pretty low. And at night, it's going to be really low, perhaps almost close to zero. So uh, this sort of a bimodal graph is roughly what you'd expect given what you know about the system. But uh, could you do better? Could you do, uh, could I ask, could you kind of what's more? So why would you want to know more? Well, one thing might be that uh, perhaps there's a possibility of extending the plaza, making it bigger, or alternatively uh, establishing something on it, a, a stage or a kiosk, which would reduce the size of the plaza and then have fewer people in it. And so let's say the current capacity of the plaza is this value over here. And it turns out that these changes would result in the plaza being either bigger, which comes at a cost, or smaller, which would, come at, which would make it lower. And in this situation over here, it might turn out that there are some peaks which are going to be above the, the capacity of the plaza. So what mean, that means is that either people are going to be squeezed together or they're going to overflow into the traffic, which would not be a very good sign. So knowing the nature of these peaks, how, uh, how big they are, is going to be important. And so we want to somehow relate the number of uh, peaks over here, or the size of the peaks, the, which is over here, this dashed line represents the size of the peaks, to something about the nature of the plaza. Where is it? Where are these people coming from, and what are they doing? <laughs> and if you zoom in, if I literally zoom in over here, what I would see is that there would actually be not a single peak like this. In fact, what you're going to see is that there's going to be some structure over here. And I guess I'm just going to try and uh, redraw this over here. So if I keep this structure over here as 5 p.m. and 9 a.m., what's really going on is that there's going to be these teeny tiny little oscillations going up and down. And these oscillations are going to be uh, related to the arrivals of trains and the departures of trains, but pr primarily, primarily the arrivals of trains. So each time a train comes in, it's going to drop some people into the plaza and then they dissipate and the next train brings another load and, and next train and so on. And what happens is that actually over this period of time that you're looking at this section period of time, the load doesn't fully dissipate before the next train comes in. And at the peak time over here, uh, the trains are arriving so fast and they're so full of people that the plaza actually starts filling up and the set of people uh, departing from a train haven't had a chance to leave the plaza before the next load of uh, passengers descends onto the plaza. And that lets why the plaza builds up. And then in this period of time over here, what's happening is that the arrivals are being exceeded by the departures. So even though there are small bumps like this little bump over here, in fact, uh, what's happening is that the plaza is slowly dissipating. And at the end of the morning rush, we enter into sort of quiescent period with some trains. And at night, assuming there are no trains at all, there are essentially very few people left. OK, so what we realize is that the plaza essentially is acting like a buffer. It is 
there are there are, and we draw a buffer like this it's acting like a buffer and we have inputs into the buffer which are coming in from the passengers arriving onto the uh, on, on each train and their outputs these are people dissipating going off to wherever they're going off to in london but um, the trains bring in people and then the plaza buffers it this is the plaza and then the people depart into the destination all right, so when you think about how big the plaza should be, this is that vertical uh, horizontal line I drew earlier, it really has to do with how often are the trains arriving, how many people are they bringing in each time, and how quickly can they dissipate, you know, this depends on uh, the carrying capacity of the streets nearby and whether there are any pedestrian crossings and all these kinds of things. Okay, so the model we want to therefore create is a model where we have a certain number of arrivals over here and a certain expectation of departures. And by taking the arrivals into account and the departures into account and the difference between the two, we can come up with the model of the occupancy of the plaza, which is this value over here, the occupancy, let's call that O. So the arrivals A, departures D, and generally speaking, O equals A minus D. You know, that's not exactly right, but it's good enough for the moment. Okay, and we want to size the plaza in some way. Um, in this form of the problem, what we have is that the arrivals and departures are in some sense outside of our control. So we are given that a particular train schedule exists, the trains are full with a certain number of people, and you know, this, this graph in some sense is descriptive. It tells us what's happening, but it doesn't really tell us what we can do to change it. So for example, if one were to say that we are going to have to reduce the size of the plaza to some low value, then there's some event going on and we want to reduce the size of the plaza so the capacity of the plaza goes down, you know, you set up a stage for some performance. What can we do about, about these arrivals? In some sense, what we have over here is that we have the uh, unmodified arrival process being like this, and we're now given an external constraint, you know, reduce the arrivals, right? How can you reduce the arrivals? So the new arrival process looks something like that. It goes below this, and then perhaps it overflows a little bit like this, and then stays below this like this, so that we never overflow the capacity of the plaza. In order to do this, we actually need control, okay? And what we need, what we need a control is that we are able to change the arrival process so that it conforms to the desired goal. And the goal is to keep the number of arrivals below or keep the plaza capacity below this red line over here. In such a system, we can actually have some control, which is the choice of uh, the two or three things one could do. One of them would be to change the train schedule. Remember that the plaza builds up when trains arrive. And so perhaps we might tell the train drivers, uh, don't run trains so often. Uh, or alternatively, you can say each train must carry no uh, more than 50% you know, capacity so that the number of people arriving in each train is the same. Or you could make announcements on the train saying, please get off at the previous stop. You know, Don't get off at King's Cross, it's too crowded. So whatever these control mechanisms are, these controls essentially change the arrival process. And again, what we want to do is how do we choose the controls such that the arrival process and therefore the plaza capacity doesn't overflow uh, and so the system behaves as we would wish it to. Uh, if we can control things properly, we can actually gain some things. We can gain an efficiency. So it means, this means, for example, that we can, uh, if you do things properly, maybe the size of the plaza can be permanently reduced or we can improve performance. In our case, performance would be perhaps the related to how long you have to wait from the, uh, the delay that it takes from the time you leave a train to the time you get to the street. So it's the delay. We want to reduce the delay so that people can uh, get out as soon as possible, and that would be related to efficiency. And perhaps we want to reduce the system cost. We want to reduce the cost by, again, maybe reducing the plaza size, or maybe we can arrange things so that uh, the, there is some, there's some retail set up on the plaza. You can make money that way that offsets the public cost of maintaining it. At any rate, we can reduce the cost. So these are all the reasons why we want to control the system. 
and then this becomes prescriptive. And in other words, we are, we are prescribing the outcome we would like to achieve by controlling the parameters, in this particular case, controlling the arrival process or the arrivals of trains and passengers into the system. Why am I going on so much about King's Cross and trains and platforms and so on? You know, is this really computer science? <laughs> Actually, in some way it is. Imagine the following system. Here's a rack of servers. And imagine that on this rack of servers, somewhere over here, I have a web server. And this web server is, is serving requests from customers. And what I want to do is I want to serve these customers. And so what happens is that we can draw them the same way. We have a server and each customer request coming in is an arrival. And what happens is that the server keeps a buffer of pending requests. And it then eventually serves the request and the request departs. So what we have is essentially the arrival of requests and uh, which and, and uh, into the buffer. And whenever you cannot serve the request immediately, it goes into the buffer. And if an arrival happens when the buffer, the set of pending requests is full, then the arrival is going to get dropped. So we are going to have uh, a system where the uh, where the customers are not going to get the request fulfilled, which is probably going to make them upset. And if you're running this for your company, it's going to make your boss very unhappy. Equally bad is when this size of the buffer is too big. So a customer arrives and perhaps it takes as long as 10 seconds before the response comes back to the customer uh, because the buffer was large enough, but it was just very full. And so this also upsets customers because it's like you click on something, you want to buy something, you click on it and time passes and time passes and nothing happens. And you say, well, that's fine. I'm not, I don't want to buy this anymore. And you renege on your shopping cart. And it's been estimated that each a few hundred milliseconds of delay in delivering a response to a customer in uh, when they try to buy something from an online website actually results in uh, a substantial loss of income to companies such as Amazon or other online retailers. So when you think about the number of requests awaiting service in the buffer, it's rather similar to the system that we described over here. It's very much like the arrival of passengers, except they're not coming on trains, they're coming from other computers and they're coming across the internet. But in the same way, if we were to look at the graph of time and be looking at the buffer capacity over here, so this is the buffer size, what happens is that we have essentially arrivals and departures. And when the arrivals exceed the departures, the buffer size goes up. And when the departures exceed the arrivals, it goes down. Of course, it's, it never goes below zero. And then it goes up again, it goes down again. And so again, we have the choice of things to uh, describe the system. We can look at the descriptive model and we can say, okay, how do these arrivals happen? And obviously there are no trains happening, but we can look at the time of the day and we say, well, we expect to get, I don't know, 1,000 requests per second in the peak times over here. So this value is like 1,000. And then perhaps in the off-peak times, we are down, uh, sorry, this is, not, this is the wrong uh, graph. This is the buffer size, not the arrival process. But uh, if we were to look at the arrival process, which is a different graph over here. So here's time and here is the arrival. So I'm saying there are more people arriving over here and then there are fewer people arriving over there. So the peak time, we have 1,000 requests per second. And then perhaps at other times, you're down to about 200 requests per second. And this is because of uh, whatever past observations that we have. So that's a descriptive thing. An alternative would be for me to say, OK, I wanted to reduce the buffer size down and keep it below a certain target value. Let's say the buffer size should be less than 225 requests. So there should be no more than 225 values in the queue. Otherwise, if you have more than 225 values in here, then the delay is too large. So I need to then control the arrival process and reduce it down somehow so that we are never going to exceed this 225 buffer size value. And then that would be a prescriptive approach. So in this course, we're going to essentially look at both descriptive and prescriptive approaches. For the descriptive approach, we have what's called a, an open system. 
an open system, meaning that we uh, arrivals and departures are happening sort of on their own accord with no control. And this is done using the techniques of queuing theory. And in particular, uh, we will be studying a, the idea of uh, uh, how arrivals happen when the arrivals are not deterministic, but are what are called stochastic. And so we'll actually study stochastic processes uh, first. And then uh, we will use the knowledge of stochastic processes to actually study queuing theory. And then in the prescriptive side, we will study uh, the, the you will study control theory, which tells us how to control the system in order to achieve a certain outcome, a certain desired goal. And again, the prerequisite for control theory will be the transform domain, which is uh, signal systems and transforms. And so I will we will first look at the transform domain and then go into control theory subsequent to that. And then finally, we realized that for any complex system, neither the descriptive nor the prescriptive system, uh, methodologies uh, that are classical, that is queuing theory and control theory, work very well. And so it turns out that there is a, another approach which is uh, far easier in general to carry out, which is called simulation, and it can be used for studying complex processes. And we will study how to uh, simulate using what's called discrete event simulation. So the overall view of the uh, course would then be to first look at uh, stochastic processes and queuing theory for the descriptive approach, then go into the transform domain, so studying signals, systems, and transforms, and then use statistical control theory, which is the prescriptive approach, and then finally end with a study of simulation, which allows us to look at uh, and uh, model both descriptive and prescriptive approaches using discrete event simulation.